What's going on everybody? Welcome to episode 5 of the Yamcast. Today we're going to be looking at news of the new Carbon FTR. We got a couple other bits and bobs of news there. Then we're going to be taking some calls from our Discord members and then we're going to be looking at some wretched Craigslist spikes and some comments. Let's get into it. Before we jump in, just wanted to remind you guys that we're still running our special promotion on merch. If you go to yamenewmerch.com, pick out a shirt, pick out a hat, whatever you want, every dollar you spend is gonna get you two X entries plus 10% off by using the code TRIPLE2020 at checkout. Now let's get into the news, Spite. What's our first one for today? So our first one, it's not really a full news story so much so as Indian has released a 12 second teaser for a bike that is going to be revealed in two days. Uh, and that is this FTR Carbon model. Mm. And the, in the video, uh, which I will mute and run in the background here, they're saying that it's basically the FTR 750, which, okay, cool, but if it's still just the 1200 and it's now made out of carbon fiber and it's got, you know, a $20,000 price tag, mm -hmm. Does the world really need another FTR 1200? Yeah, to me it's kind of funny saying it's going to be a you know the lightweight FTR 1200 with the carbon. I'm like, okay, so you're going to take a 530 pound motorcycle and make it 510 pounds. Yeah, you know what I mean, um, and it's a shame because the bike that I've always wanted from Indian was the hardcore FTR 750 flat tracker. Like, mm -hmm. give us that, give us that bike, and you teased it, you had it at the shows, you had all. The, I, I don't understand. Why? I mean, I get it because they want, you know, to, to kind of split the difference between the big power cruiser boys and like someone looking at like a monster or something. The FTR 1200 makes sense, got lots of torque, premium bike, but I think they're discounting how well a 750 could sell. Yeah. Honestly, I think it could do super, super well if they put out a competitor to your XSR 700s and 900s, the Z900s, like a proper middleweight sports bike, kind of like the Bronx is supposed to be, no. right? But to your point, a, you know, a carbon edition FTR, if it's going to have the kind of exorbitant price tag I think it's going to have, I want to see Olins, I want to see Brembos, I want to see all kinds of nice features on this bike. And to be honest, I rode the FTR in Tucson out in February, and I wasn't super impressed with it. I mean, it's mm -hmm. a cool bike, but I don't really know what it was trying to be. Um, sometimes you get on a bike, like you get on the desert sled, you're like, okay, adventure bike, really tall bars, going to be fun to chuck around a dirt track. Uh, you get on the supermoto, you're like, okay, lightweight, wheelie pop and hooligan bike. You get on uh, an MT-10, you're like, oh, super awesome, super naked. I don't really know what the FTR 1200 was supposed to be, but you really want to ride one, right? Yeah, I actually think the FTR was aimed kind of directly at someone like me, mm -hmm. uh, but I think it's just, in a world where the Sportster exists and is so moddable, it's really hard for them to set, turn around and sell me a brand new kind of unproven motorcycle that is 14,000 bucks, you yeah. know? Um, I just, I don't see the value of the FTR in their lineup because it's so different, you know? They're basically, they're trying to take like, they're trying to almost do what Ducati's done with the Scrambler line. And they've got a really great engine and now they're putting it in a bunch of different stuff. The Scout 60. Scout uh, 1200, Scout Bobber, um, FTR 1200, FTR 1200S, FTR 1200 uh, Carbon. Yeah. But those are essentially all the same bike to me. Mm. You know, the, the, the FTR looks cool. It feels like a bigger version of the street rod, what I think Harley should have made. But I, I don't know. I just, I don't, I, whenever I see it, I'm like, oh, I could, I could see myself owning that bike. And then I think about it a little more and I'm like, it's only making 120 horsepower. It's a torque it's, first engine. Yes. I mean, you, you can feel it's cruiser heritage when you're on it. I mean, it, it pulls super hard from the low end. It's got nothing up top. But without- Not nothing, it just doesn't scream, right? Without knowing 100% what that FTR makes in terms of foot pounds of torque, I just think the, the Sportsters make 70. Yeah. Right away. Literally, you, you crack the throttle open just a little bit from idle and the bike just, it's, it's up. 
Yeah. I mean, they make 70 foot pounds of torque at 2000 RPM. Yeah. The FTR probably doesn't do that because it's making 120 horsepower. If you have a high horsepower number, you take, tend to have a lower torque figure. Mm -hmm. You know, it's just the way the engine's geared. I think of a cruiser, like a performance cruiser like that, as having a big torque figure. Yeah. Really big torque figure. And again, I still think the Sportster... I could make a Sportster, an FTR 1200, for $1,500 worth of parts. Yeah. You have something that would give you probably 90% of the feel and flavor of it. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, you know, maybe this will come out and we, just, we both just eat crow and it's amazing. But mm -hmm. I don't know. It just looks like a bit of a cash grab of some, you know, super high-end model of a already bit overpriced motorcycle, honestly. Mm -hmm. uh, but I'm sure it's going to be very pretty, I, honestly. The, the <laughs> FTR, for all that I dish on it, it's just drop-dead sexy. Very sexy motorcycle. You can't deny it. I it, mean, it's very pretty. To look yeah, at. it's freaking gorgeous. The lines are awesome. Just, yeah. You can tell the cruiser's in there somewhere, but just hopped up to the next level. Yeah, it feels um, very long. It's got a very long wheelbase, and that's mm -hmm. the first thing you notice about it. And it's at least when I took it out on those mountain roads in Tucson, that's the first thing. As soon as I chucked it in, it just kind of lumbers over. And that's mm -hmm. due to the tires, too. It's got those flat track tires, but still, it's... Um, it's a really strange uh, geometry to that bike. Super, right. super different. And it doesn't help that while I was there in Tucson, I was riding the MT-10 daily. <laughs> so I had a bit of a weird reference point for it. But yeah, I don't know. It wasn't really one of my favorite bikes that I've ridden. I wonder what you would have thought if you were riding it back to back with the sled. It's totally different from the sled. Really? Yeah, the sled has more in common with your DRZ than the FTR. Interesting. The sled literally feels like a, a mega motard. I, I, mm -hmm. Seriously, like it sits like this, you know? Like, you just want to, like, you know, hit stuff and hit rocks and, you know, pop wheelies with it. The FTR is really kind of leaned over, honestly. Interesting. And the controls are super kind of mid-forward. They're not exactly behind you mid, but they're also not super forward. Kind of like a 90 degree sitting in yeah, a chair. Yeah, kind of like your, uh, your street rod, in yeah. a way. Not, not as much, but less, you yeah. know? Uh, yeah, it's, it's an odd motorcycle. That's why during my review of it, super quick ride that I had on it, I was like, I don't really know where this bike fits. I mean, it's not a sports bike, it's not a cruiser, it's something in between and it fits a very s narrow slice of uh, the market. And I kind of feel like that narrow slice has already bought their FTR 1200. Yeah. Are they gonna trade it in for the FTR 1200 Carbon because it's the new shiny one? I think Indians be sort of, you know, banking on the fact that their customer base is gonna be similar like a Ducati customer base, mm. you know, where they see a Carbon Edition, they're like, well, let me pull out my checkbook and let me, <laughs> I gotta go get it, you know? Whereas a lot of Indian guys that I've met, like Dan Dan the Fireman, for example, he scrimped and saved and he got that bike because it was his dream bike. As soon as mm -hmm. it came out, he wanted it and he saved for it and he got it. So I think Indian's customer base is actually a little bit more uh, blue collar and normal than your Harleys or your Ducati boys, honestly, mm -hmm. who can't just, you know, whip out a checkbook and just write it and go get it, you know? Yep. Uh, but again, let's see the full pictures and all that. This podcast was terribly timed because we don't have all the details, but that's the way it goes sometimes. What's our next bit of news? Our next bit of news is a little bit of data from European motorcycle markets that are showing some interesting trends. Right, so we have uh, the top blurb here. European motorcycle markets lost 38% in March, breaking a long string of positive months ending the first quarter 2020 with 292,996 uh, 292, sales, 13% down. Um, this kind of just feels like, you know, w there's obvious external pressure right yeah I, I feel like this is a this is a almost like a no Sherlock kind of thing but you know what's frightening to me to think about is um, for uh, e even in Europe and th I mean this is interesting to think about in Europe motorcycles are much more like standard modes of transportation you know, right way they're, of life not, kind they're, of thing. they're a way of life and they're not really like here in America they're kind of toys or fun things that we like to have but they're not you know modes of transportation so to see that much of a decline in a place where it's not really a quickly, you know, kind of disposable good like that is a bit frightening to think. I mean, conditions in the economy aren't really good right now. And um, 
you know, I think the American motorcycle market is probably going to be hit even harder than this, honestly. Because mm -hmm. you think about it, when you have an income crunch like we've seen in the economy where most people have, you know, either, I wouldn't say most people, I think it's like one in 10 people now are like unemployed or have had some sort of furlough or have like lost income in their household in general. I mean, the motorcycle is going to be the first thing to go if they yeah. have one. They might sell it. They're not going to get another one. So to me, the worrying thing is thinking about like people who are riders have sold their bike and now won't be riders anymore. Yeah. You know what I mean? So that, that might be a bad thing that happens out of this. What do you think? It's actually funny. Uh, I was in traffic yesterday and this is how bad the traffic was. I pulled up next to a guy on, I believe it was a road glide. Um, and we were able to just sit and talk to each other. Were you on the traffic. VFR? Yeah, I was sitting on the VFR. And he was saying, uh, we, he got to talking about picking up the next bike uh, and he was like, I bought the, I bought this road glide or whatever it was for like 21 last year. And then he went to the dealership and they were getting ready to offer him like 24 for it or something like that. They were just more money. Yeah. It was what? like, like somehow the, the value of the motorcycle to a dealership went up cause they want him to get, they want to just get him on the. New on the new one, light. okay. They're like, all right, we, we need you. We need to sell this motorcycle, like now. <laughs> I want to take my Ducati back to Ducati Austin and be like, how much are you give me for this? And they're like, keep it. <laughs> <laughs> we don't want it. <laughs> They'll just take one look at the ring, the mountain of washers, yeah. and be like, oh no. <laughs> the mamma mia. <laughs> Vito, my guy over there. Uh, that's interesting. They give, we want to give them more for the, that's crazy. Yeah. But yeah, but I mean, we just saw it on that other website. I think the Indian website we pulled up, it was like, no payments until October. I mean, yeah. dealerships right now are desperate to move inventory. So, I mean, this is also the thing we're going to see. And a lot of uh, manufacturing and factories right now aren't even producing new ones. Yep. They're just like trying to figure out what the demand is going to be for Q3, Q4, and no one really knows. You know what I mean? It's so hard to predict what the hell is going to happen in the next six months in this economy. Which makes me think if certain brands like say a Harley Davidson would take a look at their lineup and be like, do I need to sell seven different kinds of Sportster or can I pick the best ones, the 883, the 48, the Roadster and be like, that's the new Sportster lineup. Yeah. And just ax all the rest of them because do you need to split, do you, do you need to have so many different options? Like the Street, the street Series, I can't imagine the 500 survives something like this. Probably not. You know, it's it's such a wretched little motorcycle. That is a bad motorcycle. I'm sorry if you own one, <laughs> but the Street 500 is a bad motorcycle. Right. Uh, and it's just, oh, I don't see Harley being like, yeah, we need to still make this bike. Yeah. I mean, they can still make it overseas because that's where it sells, but mm -hmm. here, I'd be stunned to see one on a show floor in, in the next 12 months. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Um, I just think that, you know, there's going to be really tough times ahead for the motorcycle market in general. Mm -hmm. um, I think, I mean, I cannot, I cannot think of a, you, you can maybe make the case that as budgets tighten, people would go to motorcycles because they're cheaper modes of transportation. But I really don't think that there's that substitutable from cars in American culture. Like the, the car is such a staple good, you know what I mean? It's such a staple thing that people have in their household that like, they need for most cases to live and function in the world, especially in America. It's like, you gotta get groceries, you gotta go to work. But at the same time, this has kind of flipped everything on its head where like people are stuck at home. People aren't really going anywhere. So I have no idea. I think, yeah. I think it's really hard to predict what's gonna happen with the motorcycle market in general, but clearly it's down obviously because everything else is down. Yep. Except for the Dow Jones, which soared today on news of some miracle cure for COVID because they're living in la la land. Meanwhile, <laughs> Again, one in 10 people are unemployed and stocks are up. Stocks can't go down, guys. They can only go up. <laughs> Makes no sense. It's, it's insane. It's crazy, crazy times. Uh, but yeah, do we have any other bit of news? Uh, I think everything else is relative to this. So I think yeah, we're- it's like the whole, I mean, this is what everyone's talking about. So. Yeah, it's, yeah, this is, it's really, like you said earlier, it's very strange to see the European market having this much trouble. Yeah. And they've, I think they were up year over year in 2019 and they then were coming up on 2020. It was like, mm -hmm. oh cool, more bikes are being sold. But like they were saying, they started hot and then yeah. suddenly just massive external pressure just sunk everything. Yeah. Well, on that somber note, let's move on to our calls. <laughs> 
Alrighty guys, we're now starting the portion of the podcast where we're taking calls from our Discord boys. If you want the chance to give us a call, join us up on Discord on yamynoob.co. Let's do it. Let's do it. All right, first call. Hello, Eric. You're on the Yamcast. What's going on, man? Hey, what's going on, Yam? This is uh, Eric Cano. I have the, uh, I got the Hornet. Yeah, I remember you. So for everyone at home, this is Eric, the winner of the Hentai Hornet that we gave away last year in January. Dude, how's it treating you? Uh, I mean, it's, it's been a pretty good bike. Uh, just did minor things for it. Um, the bike's been running pretty good. Um, did some stuff with the mirrors. Uh, put a power commander on it, but that's about it. Uh, Spite helped me out with that. He's uh, he's been a big help. Yeah, how's that? How'd that power commander wake the bike up? I know on mine, um, when I put the tune on there, it actually got rid of the really kind of nasty exhaust smell that the bike can have. Yeah, you and said it stunk, right? Yeah, yeah. it it smelled. The, the, the super early um, fuel injection for the the hornet 919 basically it runs super super rich when it's uh at idle mm-hmm. so at stoplights you basically start to just smell fuel and you're like oh crap you know what's <laughs> going on but the uh the power commander really leans out the uh the idle and then uh you get a lot more bottom end torque and it's not nearly as grabby as the uh you know right off the line so yeah you start smelling uh, a lot you smell some fuel at the stoplight, and you're like, that dang yammy noob crap bike. <laughs> God damn it. <laughs> and I couldn't get one of the nice new ones. I got the first one. <laughs> Just like with your, your 675, the, uh, the shift lever fell off one day. Yes. Uh, yeah, yeah. I remember when mine fell off. But the shift lever fell off on the Hornet? Yeah. Yeah. I was, I was just riding along when to go to shift, and suddenly it wasn't there. <laughs> was it's like, a true yeah, crap bike. I like... I had to uh, just park the bike on a side street and go back like a quarter of a mile to try to find it in the street. Dang. Uh, I'm, I'm still wondering whether or not that bike, because that bike was an amalgamation of two, for those of you who don't know. Um, and I don't know if that's the original frame that you bought or if that's the donor frame that they put the, the, all of the hentai hornet stuff onto. I don't know which way they did it. Yeah, yeah. It's, but it's some Franken bike of two Hornets. Yeah, yeah. I think it, it's the the frame from the original Hornet because that's the uh, what mileage the odometer has, and that follows the frame. Oh, okay. So it still has the I think so, fifty something thousand miles. I think it was. Yeah, so it, it's some ridiculous amount of mileage for a motorcycle. Yeah, uh, but the engine only has like twenty something k on it, and. I put another, I don't know, six, seven thousand miles on it. Oh wow, that's I've, awesome! I've had it. It's such a great bike to ride for a long time, right? Yeah, it's um, uh, I I reduced the gearing so it'll actually like, you know, be able to be used under ten miles an hour in a parking lot or whatever. Uh huh. Um, uh, but but on the highway, like for some reason, everything resonates perfectly at ninety five miles an hour. <laughs> there don't be any vibrations so it's, it's, it's a dangerous situation because you know on one side I don't want to go 95, mile, 95 miles an hour but at like 80 and it being Florida you know uh, you're getting passed by everyone and the, the bike's vibrating yeah Florida highways are a lot like Texas highways 85 is like you know right lane speeds you yep. know what I mean yeah yeah exactly uh, except for uh, Florida, you, you have all the the elderly individuals that are going 45 in the left lane. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Man, it is so great to hear that the Hornet's still working strong and doing its thing because uh, there, there was a moment of darkness there when we were finishing up and I was like, I don't know if this bike's ever going to run right, but then I think with the, the new engine and the, all the work the guys up at Maxim Honda did up in Dallas, um, I think it turned out to be like a goofy yet really well-functioning motorcycle, which is really awesome. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. Uh, some of uh, some of uh, the wiring I had to do some stuff with, but as far as like uh, engine engine stuff, they've it's it's been working perfectly. Uh, it's a, kind of a shame you never got to ride it because it was, you know, it's a it's a lot of fun once it actually runs right. I think it was um, having some cam issues when you first got it, right? When you rode it home. 
Yeah, it had some it had some cam issues and the cam chain tensioner or something was wrong with it. And then once I got my hands on it and tried to do the valves, I think I just, you know, <laughs> just I just broke it more and more and more and more. <laughs> I'm pretty sure that's what happened. Because um, it was way in over my head. But uh, that's why you call professionals and, and fix it. Yeah. Um, what was I going to say about that? Uh, dang, I forgot. But, yeah, no, I never got the chance to ride it, though. I only rode it around the block when I first purchased it. And it had been like 18 months since I'd been on a bike and I got on the Hornet and I was like, God, this is so fun. I forgot how much fun it was, it was riding. And it was such a great feeling just to be back on a bike in general that I didn't even care that it was like a nuggety, horrible 919 that I was on, you know, it was really, really cool. But yeah, I mean, one of the plans I had for 2020 before all this pandemic stuff was I wanted to go and visit all of the giveaway bikes that I gave away. So I wanted to fly out to Tampa and do a meetup and hang out with you and check out the Hornet. I wanted to go meet Lou and see the R1 or R3 that he looped. Uh, you know, it would have been a lot of fun, but maybe someday we can come out and meet up. Yeah, no, I mean, definitely. I mean, I, I don't think I'll be moving anytime soon, so, you know, just let me know. Uh, the, having the, the Hornet kind of makes me want um, a Ninja 400, because <laughs> I want a bike that's more flickable, because the, uh, the Hornet's not a... I mean, it's fast in a straight line, but it, it doesn't want to lean over too much. Yeah, it takes a little bit of effort to get it flicked over, that's right. Yeah, so... But I, you know, I only have room in my garage for too many for so many bikes. So <laughs> yeah, you know how it is. I actually I don't. I have this whole storage space here. I, I can fit like thirty motorcycles in here. But I used to know how that felt. Definitely, <laughs> <laughs> lots of room for yeah, toys here. I mean, you have to. Uh, well, you have to move all your workout stuff and um, and move the Z out so you can do anything on the bikes. Yep. Yeah, that was back in the day. Man, times have changed. Uh, but yeah, anyways, we started reminiscing about the Hornet, but did you have a question or something we, we could help you with or something like that? No, I just, um, I, I don't know, I think in November I thought I'm going to get a GoPro and give an update on the bike, but then that never happened, so I just kind of wanted to follow that up for the, uh, you know, the, the people that are still aware that it existed. Awesome. Yeah, I'm sure they'd really like to hear that on the, on the podcast, just a quick update about the Hornet. That's really sick, man. Thank you. Uh, I'll take care, Amy. All right, see you, man. Bye. Catch you later. It was great hearing from him. That's so cool. Yeah. I mean, it's just crazy that it's still going strong and, and doing its thing, you know? And yeah. this audio is f***ing out probably because of this dude outside. Yeah, I'm not sure he's got his music loud enough. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe it won't pick it up on the mic, but I'm pretty sure it will. Yeah. But, I mean, that's just so cool. Because I, I remember when I first went to see it, when I brought the donor bike Then you up, understood. And I was like, oh my god because <laughs> you and the crew were all like get the hornet yeah it's gonna be great and i went and got it i was like oh, i don't know about this bike and then <laughs> yeah it was um not a good one yeah, yeah no i the hindsight being what it is it, we probably should have just done something simpler yeah as a incredibly novice mechanic that i still am today tackling that with my skill set was not a good idea mm -hmm. yeah so that's the lesson for all you guys at home. Don't tackle a project that you uh, aren't really confident about because things happen and then all of a sudden it spirals out of control and you spend $10,000 on a $2,000 bike. <laughs> <laughs> Super cool. <laughs> all right, let's see if we can get another caller going here. Man, May 15th is going to be a good day though, huh? wonder what's going to happen then. <laughs> I wonder if there's a little surprise over in the other room for everyone else on May 15th. Hmm. How's it going? You are on the Yamcast. Who are we speaking with? Uh, Toshin from Discord. Hey, what's up, man? Hey, uh, how's the weather treating you guys out there? It's pretty good. It's starting to get warm here in Texas. Uh, it was, the last couple weeks has been, you know, that nice, crisp, kind of 70, 75 degree day here, and all of a sudden it's 87, 90, and all of a sudden it's going to be Satan's asshole once again here. <laughs> <laughs> Every year it's always the same. I don't know why it's going to change. What can we do for you? I had a quick question for you. Uh, I just recently in November had a crash. Uh, destroyed the bike, unfortunately, and my left ankle. So I've been recovering uh, pretty much all this time. And uh, I had a chance to get back on a bike. Was able to run it with no problem, no PTSD or anything about being on a bike. But I did have a few issues uh, with shifting since it's my left leg. Had a few problems on the sport bike. Didn't have any problems on the upright naked. So my question is uh, basically, how long did it take you to uh, recoup and get back to where you were 100% on a bike? And did you wait the full time or get back on there as soon as you were able to pretty much do it without pain? So let me ask you this. Uh, on the other bike where it was harder to shift, did you see if you could adjust the shift lever to give yourself a little bit more space to kind of move your foot or, 
or is it just the the reach on the shifter? What, what was it? I'm not a doctor, but I was just curious. What was the problem there? I'm pretty sure it was just the way it was positioned, possibly the reach. I had to pick my whole foot up off the peg in order to shift it. Oof. Uh, so it wasn't that I couldn't, but uh, not really good uh, riding position if you have to keep picking your foot up off there and it'll throw yeah. you a little bit. Yeah, definitely not. I have to do that on my sled when I'm wearing my dirt boots because the boot is just so chunky. I have to really kind of take my whole foot off and slam down a gear. Uh, but to answer your original question, um, after my first or my second huge accident that I had, uh, I was basically ready to ride about a year after it, but I wasn't mentally ready and kind of spiritually, spiritually ready, let's say, until about 18 months after that, that incident. Uh, it took me a long, long time to be kind of ready to kind of jump back on, and I think I really needed the time away from it to kind of recalibrate sort of myself and my brain. It was actually like a really edifying experience, to be honest, to be that long away from motorcycling. I kind of feel like I restarted riding in late 2018. Uh, I feel like my riding career started again in that way. I feel like I used to ride and then I rode again type of thing, you know? Uh, but Spite, you had an accident too, right? And then you kind of were off the bike for a little bit? Yeah, uh, it was, I think it was uh, almost a year, um, 11 months, but I was very fortunate. Um, I hit the deck and walked away, you know? Um, so the, my delay was just having the, the time to go get another one, like trying to find the right opportunity, find the right bike. Yeah. Uh, cause it, I basically was reset to zero from like one and a half, you know, I yeah. was barely started. So I've seen with motorcycles, it's pretty common to where it's either like a very small incident and you're back on the bike in a couple weeks or it's usually like a six months to 12 months type of thing where you're off for a long time because they uh, have a tendency to be pretty unforgiving when you go down, it's mm -hmm. pretty tough. Uh, so if you're feeling kind of down about the time you've spent off, I wouldn't, I wouldn't feel bad about it. I wouldn't say feel bad, it's just killing me with the weather out there not being able to get out and the little bit of time I got to spend taking a couple of test rides was pretty darn therapeutic. Now, yeah. I didn't see a deer, which is what caused me to go down to begin with, so I don't know if I'm going to freak out when I see those again, but <laughs> it seemed to be pretty much okay, just a physical limitation almost on the sport bike, and I kind of miss having a sport bike. Yeah. No, I feel I mean, there's there's nothing quite like riding a motorcycle. Um, I remember when I jumped back on, I just, it's like everything fell back into place and everything clicked for me, you know, like it's just, like you said, very therapeutic. It's, it's very special. All right. Well, that was my question. Thanks for the answer, guys. Thanks, man. See you on the Discord. Hello, Andrew. You're on the Yamcast. How's it going? Oh, it's going well. How are you all doing? Doing good, doing good. What can we do for you? Um, I was just curious. Uh, what do you think is the biggest, uh, like the biggest issue in the motorcycling community today? Like whether, whether riders or as far as the bikes on the market right now, and where do you see the market being in like five to 10 years? Wow, that is, that is a, that is a huge question. And I don't know if I'm qualified to answer it. <laughs> what do I see? You said wrong with the motorcycle, I guess, industry market, just kind of like culture. What, 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 can you narrow it a little bit? Well, yeah, like, what what do you think are, are some things that, uh, like, motorcyclists in general can address as individuals in order to make it more welcoming to others and also make it less, uh, like, less clicky? Yeah, so I think you hit the nail right on the head. I think the biggest issue we have right now is just convincing people that it's a worthwhile activity, right? Because I think a lot of folks, especially for our generation, I don't know how old you are, but you sound a little bit younger. Hopefully you're the same 22. age as me. 22. Okay, cool. Yeah, so you get it. Um, I think, you know, just convincing people that it's worth it and that it's, you know, even though it's dangerous, like it's a really cool thing to do and it can be extremely positive and the communities that come around it are, are really awesome. Um, so I think that's the biggest issue we face is making sure that we don't see a decline in motorcyclists because I think right now we are a bit of a dying breed because I think a lot of people are like, wait, why am I going to jump on this two-wheel death machine and risk life and limb, you know, going down the street? Uh, and I think that, you know, going out there and making sure we're riding safe and riding courteously is a good way to do that. Um, you know, everyone likes popping wheelies and dragging knees, but there's a right time and a place to do that. Uh, wheelies, although, you know, it's, you can't even do them on track anymore, so I don't know where you're supposed <laughs> to do a wheelies. Go find a little parking lot or something. Spite, what do you think? Well, I think my, my biggest issue is just how much, uh, you know, it's either you, you're, 
if you're a sport bike guy, you're a diehard sport bike guy, and you can't like anything else, and anyone who likes anything else is stupid and dumb. Mm. Uh, same thing with cruisers. Same thing with, you know, dirt bikes. There's a lot of um, just butting heads, which is stupid because they're all bikes that all do the same thing, mm -hmm. and that's just make you happy, right? Yep. So I don't, I don't understand why there's so much just like, you know, oh, uh, Harleys are totally stupid and, you know, or Jixers are totally stupid, you yeah. know, that kind of thing. I mean, Jixers are really stupid, but... <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so I, I just think that, yeah, to your point, I feel like, you know, as motorcyclists in our own little community, just like just trying different styles of bikes, I think will show you a lot, yeah. a lot, a lot, a lot. Um, you know, if you only ride sport bikes, like swing a leg over a supermoto. If yeah. you're a dirt bike guy, like try a street bike. Um, I think that would really help and go a long way. So something came up at work with a coworker the other day and uh, a coworker was saying like, oh, it's mostly sport bike riders that give uh, motorcycling a bad name. And so that kind of threw me off a little bit because he's a Harley guy. Well, I mean, I work at a Harley dealership and like he was like, oh yeah, it's all sport bike riders that give riders a bad name. Um, Seems like a bit of a sweeping generalization there. Yeah. Yeah. Right, right. Like, is it just me or is it kind of like everyone, like there are people from each category and it's like when, before I rode, I noticed the assholes on the road. And then like once I actually started riding, I was like, okay, there's a lot more riders than I realized. And uh, most of them are decent people and riding respectfully and not being jerks to everyone around them. Like, is that something that y'all noticed as well? And do you think that like that it's just like the minority of people that are bad representatives for the for the sport or the hobby? I would say yeah, so. I think that it's um, yeah. I think that it's you know we we tend to notice and pick out just the the bad eggs, right? Mm -hmm. I mean that's like with anything. Um, and I think that you probably will and like normal people in a car would probably only notice a motorcyclist when they're doing dumb stuff if they're you know weaving in and out of traffic or popping wheelies or riding really aggressively that's when we would notice them if we we're in a car whereas you probably don't even notice the guy with the quiet adv bike just you know zipping along on his way to work right um i think it's also a case that here in america because bikes just aren't nearly as prevalent as somewhere like europe when you do see one it, it does jar you a little bit and you do notice it a little bit more like when, when you're over in europe and france or england i mean they're just two-wheel people are everywhere you know what i mean you, you can't even there's so many bikers there's so many scooters there's so many uh bicyclists it, it, you know it's all a lot more messy so i think people are more used to it there so i honestly think it's much more of an american issue that we have here like noticing motorcyclists and noticing that they're kind of bad riders or bad people and that kind of stuff but yeah i mean we can all do our part just not riding like a bunch of a bunch of idiots but at the same time you know because bikes are fun sometimes let's say in like a three-hour ride maybe for two minutes you ride like a little bit of an idiot and then someone sees you being an idiot and then they're like oh you give him a bad name you know mm -hmm. just did a little bit of a pull on your bike and then people are like oh look at this guy you know so you can't win them all either at the end of the day oh yeah Oh, yeah, I definitely ride my own ride. I ride a neon green Honda Grom to work at a Harley dealership. <laughs> You're That's my kind of guy, Andrew. You're my kind of guy. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I have a Sportster, too, but like, <laughs> I rode the Grom for a hot minute. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, I'm, I'm definitely more of the ride-your-own-ride kind of guy. I love that. Um, uh, but I want to answer your last question, which is we asked me, where do I see bikes in kind of five to ten years and all this stuff? I honestly think that super lightweight electric motorcycles are going to be big because i think that once they get them right and they get the price right the fun that you can have is going to outweigh everything else i'm imagining like a you know 175 or 200 pound bike with you know 30 or 40 horsepower from an electric engine that you can charge up at your house you know overnight and it costs like six grand or something i think that most motorcycles would be very very excited about that you know okay all right, man. I got to let you go because we've been on the call for a little bit. I want right. to see someone else. Yeah, yeah. All right. Have a good one. All right. Appreciate it. Bye-bye. Don't get the Rona. <laughs> I will try not to. Bye-bye. <laughs> uh, so we got this text. How about adding a text question comment uh, or comment? Some of us, like myself, are shy and don't like to hear ourselves later on the podcast. Uh, YouTube Live would be cool. I would definitely give a super chat. So... What do you think? Never, I've never done a YouTube live except for like our streams. So I've seen a, a, a handful of YouTube live. Yeah. Um, 
Maybe if you incorporate that, that'd be kind of cool. They're, they're, you just need to do it right. You know, yeah. you need to have the right kind of feel to it. And I think once we really get good at nailing our timing, do this, do that, do that, so we yeah. can reset the cameras and everything, I think, sure, why not bring it? Because Super yeah. Chats are kind of fun. You know, you do them, I've seen the people who do them right, mm -hmm. do them in like big batches, right? So they'll do like five or 10 Super Chats all at once in the middle. So it's like, instead of having a call-in portion, mm -hmm. they just have, you know, news story, Super Chat, news story, Super Chat, chunk yeah. like that. And then we can be answering some questions throughout the call. That could be cool. And then if we did it on YouTube Live, doing the Super Chat would be nice, but then also like taking it from Discord as well would be good. Yes. Yeah. I think we could probably, if we just started live streaming right now through like OBS on a on something, mm -hmm. we could just take it from Discord. That would function as a Super Chat. Yeah. Uh, I'll ask uh, Dan Dan the Fireman how he does his, because his live streams are really, really nice. Sweet. They're really, really pro, and we can chat with him and see how he does it. Yeah. All right, guys, that's going to wrap up our call-in section. Now let's go see some wretched Craigslist bikes and some funny comments that we, you have left on our videos. <laughs> Man, I don't know how the ball today. Your, your mind is elsewhere. My mind is elsewhere, May yeah. 15th, guys. May 15th. May 15th. Um, all right, let's check out some of the good comments we got this week on some of our videos. Spite, read us the first one, please. So our first one comes from William Brown. I'm two seconds away from buying Spite a new pair of jeans. His knee is too hot for YouTube. Not very <laughs> advertiser friendly. That is true. We have to be pretty uh, strict about our advertiser friendly guidelines nowadays, mm -hmm. and I don't think your knee's going to cut it. No. Nor I, can your sexual innuendos. <laughs> all of them have to go. Oh, so I feel like my entire joie de vivre has been just <laughs> ripped away from me. Yeah. But you know what's interesting? I think I, I would wager that people think I only own one pair of jeans. I own four pairs of jeans, all the exact same, bought them all at the same time, and I blew the left knee out on every single one of them. You're like a, you're like a cartoon character when he opens up his wardrobe and it's all the same clothes, yeah. you know? It's yeah. just black t-shirts and ripped jeans. Yeah. And the reason why is because I you work in my garage at home, which I thankfully don't have to do anymore, uh, and it has a really rough concrete surface, and I always lean on my left knee. Yeah. And so I just ripped all the material off of it, and that they all sense. just failed all at the same time. Yeah. So that's the story of why all my left knees are torn. Yep. Yeah, I feel like I, I also have like a bit of a uniform. I wear like those tight, ugly bro jeans. I tuck mm -hmm. in my shirt and I have my riding boots. It's like what I always wear on camera. Yep. Yeah. Now, I like the other day where I pulled out, and you were like, you look like such a you know, effing biscotti boy on your <laughs> desert sled with your, with your boots and your jeans and your Dainese. I was like, oh, here I am, what can you do? All right, so this next comment is on our SV650 video. Jeremy Jones said, I have that same picture of Ryan F9 in the shrine next to some of you, Papa Yam. I like that, I like the, the thought process of me and Ryan on a shrine together, um, even though I think that they uh, tend to put out higher quality stuff than we do, but we put mm -hmm. out more of it. We're a volume play here at Yammy New. But, and we don't sell gear on the internet. We just make videos. So I think sometimes people get lost in the sauce with that, where they're like, oh, the quality's so great on this. And I'm like, oh, it's a multi-million dollar company. I would, I would mm -hmm. hope that they have nice cameras. You know yeah. what I mean? I'm like, we're just two doofuses with a couple bikes. <laughs> it's not that special. Like, it's just pretty normal setup here. Yeah. Did What's you right? actually happen to see the context that this was in? I think I did, but maybe you want to pull it up so we can see it? Yeah, sure. What's going on, everybody? It's your favorite motorcycle internet yeah, content that creator, photo. Andrew, yeah. life dad, Polem Yeah, that's great. That's a guy, I don't know where he got that shot of Ryan uh, over at F9. It was on his, uh, I think he's got an Instagram. On his Instagram? Yeah, and it's I just found it. Great headshot of him. Yep. Yeah, really beautiful. Good job, Ryan, beautiful headshot. Um, <laughs> I need to get one like that, just like a, you know, looking in the camera like that. Uh, but I love that someone has a shrine of me. That's great. Mm -hmm. yeah. There's right. probably many shrines of old Yammy Noob out there in the world. What's our next comment? All right, our next one. This was on the last Yamcast. <laughs> oh no, says, Yammy Noob's brain runs at 4.5 gigahertz. <laughs> Spy runs at 2.3. <laughs> I love that. Yeah, As, I think we joke about that on the scripts for the videos. Like, I, I know you do on your videos mm -hmm. where you're like, this one's going to be more relaxed. We're not going to be, you know, breathless 12 minutes. Yeah. Uh, someone, I think, one time posted a comment on yours that said, if you play this video at 1.25x speed, it's Yami yep. Noob. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I tend to read my scripts a little quick. 
All right, next comment is from CRP. They say, Africa Twin is going into a Rebel, Honda Rebel 1100. The Cruiser World wants to see a $10,000 Rebel. Honda may be making a naked bike with that engine, but I do know that 1100 Rebel is a coming. I don't think that's gonna be happening. Okay, so I thought about that first, I thought that way for a second, and then I, then I allowed myself to think of a world where they put the Africa Twin engine you remove the in guide, a Rebel. You, remove the, you got out of the box, bro. I you got out I mean? of the box, yeah, man. Yeah. Uh, and it was just, I was like, that would be a very fun motorcycle. <laughs> that would be amazing. <laughs> I would hate that. I would hate to see a cruiser with two big pipes going out the front of it. It just wouldn't look right, you know? Oh, sure it would. It would look like some huge Vulcan. Because that's what the Vulcan is, right? It's the parallel twin. But think about it inside. Because the Rebel already, the Rebel 500's got two pipes coming out the front. It does. It doesn't look right to me. I don't know. I, I, I actually really like the look of the Rebel 500. I just think it's a very anemic cruiser. It's not a, it's not a good fit. Yeah. I, it's crazy they make the Rebel 300. Yes. Like that is a tiny engine for that bike. I think the only reason they make that bike is because they made it in the past. And they're yeah. like, we need an MSF bike to sell. That is the MSF bike. Yeah. Um, Which is weird because I think it's actually really awkward to ride because the seat is actually too low and, mm -hmm. the, and the ergos are kind of wonky because it's got, you know, cruiser vibes to it. I actually think it's harder to ride than something like a Duke, honestly. Because yep. it feels like this kind of unwieldy instead of like, you know, a bicycle. Um, but yeah, the 1100 Rebel's growing on me a little bit. That could be cool. I yeah. just I'm thinking about it a little yeah. bit more. It could be all right. The more time you spend with, because the Rebel's such a moddable bike, it's, it's yeah. I, I would love to see that world. Honda, make the Rebel 1100. Honda, this is your guy right here. He's got all the ideas. <laughs> Sign him up. Don't, I need him. He, need, he has a job here. Don't, don't take all this bike. <laughs> All right, what's the next comment? This was on the triple exhaust. Uh, Sonny Lofranco, spite local Harley boy, but on the contrary, does not enjoy ultra loud mo motorcycles. Baffling. And then Blade 643, absolute nonsense. Agreed. <laughs> How do you feel about this? I do like loud bikes, but I like them to be loud and tasteful the mm. the street triple was just noise it was just noise yeah it was really droney really yeah not, not good noise yeah yeah and whereas something like you know say a harley has a little bit it's it's quiet when it's just idling and then when you give it some gas yeah it's it think of it like a light switch no sound lots of sound mm -hmm. you know so you can you can kind of ride that bike in two different ways street triple was just noise no matter where you were yeah at idle on full song, it was bad. You know, uh, uh, an analogy I would make is you can have a guitar hooked up to some, you know, solid state amp that outputs a ton of sound. Mm -hmm. It's just going to be bad, right? Just that digital, crunchy, kind of bad digital sound. Or you could plug it into like a huge tube Marshall app stack and it's that awesome, just loud guitar sound. Yeah. You know, I like to think of like my throttle and my exhaust as like an instrument, you know, and yep. it's like, it can be loud, but it has to be sonorous. It has to be musical. It has yes. to have harmony, you know? Um, there's a difference, you know, like we said, having the street triple without the baffle. It felt like an instrument out of tune, yep. you know? Whereas you put the baffle and it's now in spec again. Yeah. And that's how I like to think about it um, because I'm so pretentious. <laughs> <laughs> Earning that biscotti yes. boy badge. Yeah, I put the baffle back on my sled, just to let you guys know. Yeah, I, I, I mean, even even though this was directed towards you, I also don't really enjoy super loud motorcycles, honestly. Mm -hmm. I think they have to, if they're gonna be loud, they have to be a race bike or it has to be the right context and the right kind of bike. You know, like a super loud Ninja 400, why? Mm -hmm. Why would you do that? A super loud RSV4, well, cool, you know? At like, the racetrack. Yeah, yeah, it sounds awesome, you know? Uh, so Funny, yeah. I was actually on the way up here, I passed a, R6 stretchy boy that had a stretched his, R6? A stretched R6. Oh, <laughs> and it was the old one too. Okay. With the like weird kind of flathead eyes. Um and it it I looked down because I heard him get on the throttle and sure Oh you were enough, on your bike, yeah? So yeah. yeah, yeah. Sure enough, his headers were cut right right underneath the bike. And I was like, that Yikes. just sounds like trash. Yeah. Yeah. So I think I think the thing about a super loud exhaust like that is it just sounds cheap. You yeah, know? it yeah. just sounds cheap, and uh, more noise isn't necessarily better. Sometimes it just sounds bad. Yeah. yeah, 
A lot of engineering goes into exhaust, guys. A lot. Yeah. No kidding. So yeah, to get all the back pressure correct and the right DBs because they have to meet emissions. Uh, that's why you know it's kind of funny thinking of people just hacking off their exhaust where it's like a, a team of like tons of really smart engineers <laughs> spent so much time making that like good. And then you just hacked it off in five minutes with a Dremel. Yeah, but you know better. Yeah, you know better yeah. by doing that. Yeah. All right, let's move on to our Craigslist bikes. All right, so our first Craigslist bike is one that I thought could be an actual sort of unique starter bike wow, we're here. Wow, we're starting off with something good today? Yeah, why Jeez. not? Yeah. Let's start with the 2014 Moto Guzzi V7 Stone. So for those of you that don't know, the Guzzi has a very unique feature that is called a transverse V-twin. So if you look close on here, this is a V-twin motorcycle, but it's mounted the other way than you're normally used to. Normally the V-twin sits along the frame like this, if you're riding in the V-twins like this, but on Guzzi's, they actually sit like this. Fun fact, Honda made a transverse V-twin for a very brief period of time in the 80s, and I think they made a turbo version of that bike too, but I'd have to look into that. Of some course of my they deep did. knowledge that I have <laughs> about that for some reason. But Guzzi's are really cool. Um, we were talking about this earlier, but I think, you know, if you like Guzzi's, you like them. If you don't know about them, you probably don't know about them, and you're not into them. They're mm -hmm. such a like die-hard kind of brand and bike. But this is such a classic gauge look right here. I mean, that literally reminds me of the 919 gauge, the two big, yep. you know, bug eye tack and speedo with the little digital stuff going on down there. Yeah, I love the kind of wraparound cowl that it has on it as well. Mm hmm. 26,000 miles? That's actually kind of impressive for a bike like this. Yeah. And then but it's a little sideways there. But well, we can, can see tell the it's. Uh, it's, it's, you know, it's really well maintained as most Guzzi's are because they're very, very beloved by their owners. Mm -hmm. um, and they're really unique bikes. Let's see what they say about it. Dare to be different. This is, <laughs> this is my really cool 2014 Moto Guzzi V7 Stone. I like that, I like that description. <laughs> Plenty of power with very little weight. From Cycle World, the V7 became an instant collectible. Lean, elegant, fresh, and reminiscent of glory days past. In European mixed riding tests, what the hell does that mean? The V7 gets 58.6 MPGs, claimed horsepower remains 48 horsepower at 6200 RPMs. Yikes. And the peak torque <laughs> pegged at 44. 48 horsepower, man. A Ninja 400 makes like 46 or 48. Mm -hmm. Wow. So you know, it's funny, you look at this and you might think like, oh, big V twin, but it's a beginner bike. Yeah. 48 horsepower, like it's nothing. But they're also selling it for 3,500 bucks. That's which beginner is like bike price. The butter zone. Yeah. Honestly, this is a good buy for a beginner. Yeah, yeah, totally. What would you give it? I think I'd give it like an eight and a half out of 10. Honestly, I really, really like it. It's really clean. It's got decent mileage for the year. It looks to be well-maintained. I think, you know, Gucci's are a little iffy for maintenance or weird, right? Mm -hmm. But relatively simple to do stuff on and everything's right there. What about yeah, you? I'd, I'd think about a nine. If I was gonna start brand new today, I'd, if I had $3,500, I would absolutely do this. Cause yeah. this is a, this is a unique esoteric motorcycle. And you know, people who know motorcycles are gonna be like, oh, that's a Guzzi, sweet. Yeah, you don't see them that often. Yeah, it's pretty cool. Let's see the next one. And this was my surprise, This is right? the surprise. So I haven't seen this one yet, guys. So let's see what's going on with this. So check oh, out this photo right here. baby. We got an itty bitty little photo. Yeah. So that that's the bike, right? Yeah. Oh. <laughs> Oh, it's a it's a do it yourself. <laughs> it's a it's a Lego bike. Okay. <laughs> oh boy. Dude, they got the skulls on the fairings. The forks are com oh wow, the forks are separated completely out. There's your dash. Oh, and it's four carbs. Mmm, lovely. Are those carbs or just the throttle bodies? No, are those, that's, the carbs? those are carbureted. Where do you see them? The, because there's the there's the um. Those are all the float bowls on the bottom. Oh yeah, I see. Yeah, that's not the electronic injection. Yeah. Yep. Jeez. No Could you imagine no, sinking no, all of no, that? Thanks, dude. Got the seat. Got the there's tank. There's your tank. And there's your frame. There's the frame. I wonder if it comes with the bucket of cement to hold it up. Yeah. Oh my god. <laughs> there's your engine. There's pieces of it missing. So. Yeah. This is this is like someone probably got this as a project and they were like, oh, I'm way in over my head. Someone else needs to buy this now. Wow, man. 
This is like a, like a, it's a ZZR 1200, right? I think so, yeah. Uh, it's like a, you know, it's like someone put a spell on it, like an RPG and just like disassembled it in place, you know what I mean? Or it looks like whenever in an RPG you have like, you just killed an enemy and there's all the items left over, you have to go pick them up, you yep. know what I mean? Like, it looks like that. I love the just box of parts. Box of parts. You'll never find what you need in a box of parts like that. What are they selling it for? I'm so curious. Thousand bucks. Thousand bucks? Honestly, that makes sense. Yeah, like, yeah. That's about how much I thought. <laughs> there's, a lot to, there's a lot to, to sift through here. Um, Apparently it was stolen and uh, then... Disassembled. Yeah, so it's, it's, it's understandable that it's in that piece, but goddamn, I would... <laughs> it's amazing they even put this up for sale mm -hmm. just to try to get some money for the parts. Uh, you know, game recognized game. Sometimes you got to hustle, sometimes you got to make a little cash, right? If you got the parts, try to sell them. But damn, you're gonna have a hard time trying to find someone to, to buy this. Maybe someone is working on a ZZR and they're like, oh sweet, like this is a crazy parts project that I can just pick up and put onto my own bike, mm -hmm. right? That's the only person I could think of buying this, honestly. I think um, the only thing that's worth real money is if the motor, if it works, which I believe they say it does not. It runs but knocks. Yeah. This is it right there. It runs but knocks. The 919 ran but it knocked. Yeah. It knocked a lot. <laughs> it kept knocking on that door. And then I think the only thing that's worth any money is the frame. The really? The saddle, too. I mean, I mean it's that, just that, the saddle, you know? That Corbin seat is quite expensive. Yeah, it's not a thousand bucks expensive with the frame. And then, you know, again, if you have your own ZZR, you got to put some parts on it. That would make sense. But other mm -hmm. than that, I don't see who would buy this thing. Yeah. Yeah. Zero out of 10. <laughs> yeah. Sorry. Complete hard pass. <laughs> hard pass. Love What's it. next? All right, this one. <laughs> Very good. Very good. Little purple Honda Ruckus. Of course, it's stretched and lowered. Um, dude, I'm starting to realize that Ruckus people are like, they're 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 also Busa boys uh -huh. in a way. I have seen so many wretched, messed up Ruckus sighs or Ruckuses in my day. Look at the clip-ons, dude. Yeah, the clip-ons are a real nice touch. <laughs> Um, I do love the, the brick holding it up. That's my favorite mm -hmm. bit. Oh, um, let's see if we can't find the, the fancy brick. There it is. Yeah, awesome. Because uh, do they not have, do they have, do they have center stands that fold them up? Yeah. But I guess this one's so long that it can't, you know, yeah, sit on it would, the stand it would, anymore. So instead of, like center stands, you pop the rear wheel up. Yeah. If you put a center stand on this, you pop the front wheel up. <laughs> So the question is, you have to bring the brick along with you when you ride. <laughs> yup. <laughs> oh, boy. Who wow. got all those words? He's very happy with all the mods. What, what is he selling it for, go up? 2300 $2, bucks. What is a Ruckus brand new? Like four. Really? It's four grand for a Ruckus? So. Yeah. Isn't Let's it? do a Google. We have yeah. this power. 2749. Huh. So he's basically selling it brand new after he broke it. Yeah, that's what I was gonna say. Like, I can spend four hundred dollars more and get a, a brand new nice ruckus. Why would I want your wretched purple stretched <laughs> ruckus? Why would I want your Barney uh, got hit by a f zap ray ruckus? <laughs> I, I can't tell. Is it rattle canned? It looks like it's rattle canned purple. It looks different shades of purple. This looks flat, and then this looks gloss. Yeah. What a, it's bad. What an uh, interesting object this has become. What is the point of stretching a ruckus? What is the point of stretching a busa? Well, a busa's got power. You gotta keep it down on the ground. Maybe the ruckus is just <laughs> making it. Maybe it's a sleeper. <laughs> Look at this pipe, man. He's gotta yeah. quiet it down somehow. Who knows, man? Turbo ruckus. That's the next giveaway, Bill. Yeah. <laughs> Turbo ruckus. We still gotta do the $10,000 uh, 10, grom at some point. The 10K grom. That would be grom. a lot of fun. Yeah. Yeah, I'm not reading all this b honestly. That's there's, too many there's, words. There's too much on here. Uh, $2,300, horrible stretch, purple ruckus, hard pass, thumbs down, see you later, <laughs> no score. <laughs> <laughs> all right, this one is a little bit more fun, I think. Now, this is, this is good stuff. This is classic, it came from Craigslist. Cool three-wheel motor scooter. It is cool, isn't it? Check it out, look at this little guy. Uh, <laughs> I mean, yeah, looks like uh, looks like your standard catch a couple STDs by looking at it, Scoot. Um, What's it? I like, the wooden, I like the wooden <laughs> basket. <laughs> Grandma came by and set up a little a little bird's uh, catcher right there. That's this. 
I recognize this gas tank from the 120 or like the 50 cc build your own bicycle kits. Yeah, that's probably what this is. I mean, good lord. It's like a little two stroke. That, that looks, it looks it looks like a little lawnmower engine. Yeah. God. And you can't even lean it. How no. sad. No, you can't. You probably three or pop two, the yeah, pop the outside, outside wheel. wheel. Let's see what words he's got here for us. Up for sale. Three-wheel motor scooter powered with the four-stroke 48cc overhead valve engine. The engine and drivetrain are brand new. Starts on first pull and runs great. Ideal for cruising around the neighborhood or outdoor flea markets. What? That's very specific, isn't it? Have it, well, have you? <laughs> he, gave, he gave away a little bit of himself there, didn't he? <laughs> I think this probably came from a flea market. Yeah. Have built, you ever been built, a... built using an older mobility scooter. <laughs> Very good. One of a kind for sure. Boom. Got it. Pick the box <laughs> from one of a kind. Yes. Pick up in Fifi, Alabama on Sand Mountain. <laughs> I don't know where the hell that is. Phone calls only. No response to texts due to scammers. Call Mike at blank. Um, you asked if I've been to a flea market. Yeah. Yes, I have. I've been to a flea market when I was very, very little. Uh, me, my brother, my mom, and my dad went. We're like, it's just going to get traction because we've never been to one. And mm -hmm. you know, being from Brazil, we were like, let's see what kind of a, you know, American flea market. That's going to be interesting. And we ended up buying two turtles from there. <laughs> we got two turtles from the flea market. Uh, one of them I killed accidentally, which is a great story if you guys are interested in hearing it. I guess I have to tell it now. Yeah. So we had this turtle and... Um, you know, I, I was just so desperate for a pet when I was little, and I finally had this turtle, and I was super stoked to have it. And, you know, I wanted to put it outside and play with it like it was a dog, right? Because mm -hmm. I just wanted to play with it like a normal pet. And so I put it outside in a little, like, it was like a little, like, plastic bin, and I was like, oh, you know, hang out outside, Mr. Turtle, like, you know, do your thing. Uh, and I went back inside to like play some GameCube or something. And I didn't realize that he had gotten outside of his little plastic bin and when I came back. So I came back, started looking around everywhere. I was like, where the hell is this turtle? Started looking, looking, looking. I was like, where's, where's this turtle? I find him in the corner of the backyard. I'm like, oh, there he is. I pick him up. He's hot to the touch. Uh -huh. He is like, like a sweltering little turtle. This is midsummer, you know, Florida. I was like, holy crap, I gotta get this turtle cooled down. So I run inside, I grab oven mitts. And I get a nice, cool, you know, bin of water to put this turtle in. I put the bin down. I grab the turtle, you know, kind of hot pocket him back over to the, the, the kitchen. I put him in the cold water. And all of a sudden, he goes, all his little limbs stretch out. His neck stretches out. And he stops moving. I thermal shock the turtle. <laughs> yep. So when I was seven years old, I dropped the turtle in the water and just watched him die right in front of me, this flea market turtle. And you guys wonder why I'm screwed up. You wonder why I buy turbo boosts and that kind of stuff. This is why I got traumatized when I was a young age. So yes, I do have experience with flea markets. That's it, that's a, I feel like that's not an uncommon story to follow a flea market tale. Yeah, what about you, have you been to flea market? Oh, absolutely. <laughs> I've been, I grew up in the, the Midwest and we had, uh, when I went to college in Wisconsin, so that's kind of like a way of life up there. I mean, they just sell, I was really little when we met, but they just sell pretty much anything and mm -hmm. everything, it's right? It's like gypsies. Gypsies, yeah. yeah. They just empty their garage and then yeah. they just throw it in a flatbed and then haul it and then come take some of my crap. Yeah. And this is apparently ideal for hauling crap, hence the wooden box. Amazing, yeah. Perfect for the neighborhood or outdoor flea markets. Revealing a lot in that listing there, and it's one of a kind. I love when they say one of a kind. One one of these podcasts, we need to set up like a bingo square of, yes. it came from Craigslist We bingo. have it on a big board back here where we yep. just <laughs> <laughs> slap it down. It would be so easy to do. Like, uh -huh. Boosas, one of a kind, uh, mobility scooters. We could, yeah, yep. it would be so easy. Yeah. All right, our last... We gotta give this one a rating. Oh, yeah, I forgot. I think I'm gonna give this one a six out of 10 for just pure fun factor, honestly. I think it's definitely silly. I would never own one. I'm gonna give it like a four out of 10. It's $425, you paid more for your Electron. Yeah, that's, well... And this could get you around the flea market. Your Electron can't do that. No, you're right. <laughs> but I, do, do I need a mobility scooter? Do you have to insure it? 
Probably not. Well, you, it's, you it's can't, a liquor you can't, cycle. You can't plate it. Yeah, like you can't get it registered. <laughs> yeah, it's a liquor cycle. Um, one of these days, we gotta just buy like two mobility scooters on Craigslist and just do some challenges with them. That would be a lot. Be of so fun. good. We got the truck now. We can just throw them in there and just, <laughs> just go find places to Take challenge them to a with go them. Kart track. Yeah. yeah, it would be great. We gotta do that. But some of them are really expensive, like those jazzies are like two grand. So mm -hmm. we, we got to get these. This actually would be more fun because you actually have a throttle. Yeah. As opposed to like a push And button. an engine, yeah. 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 So maybe we should buy this. <laughs> <laughs> Where is it even? Like it's in Alabama. Alabama. Yeah, in, Fee in Fifi or Fife, Alabama. On Sand Mountain. You got to climb the On mountain to Ma get this. Why don't you Google Fife or Fifey, Alabama in the mountains? Ding, 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 ding. Out past the banjos. Good lord. Yeah, oh this my is. Oh god. This is in the middle of nowhere. That's literally in the. What is the nearest town? The nearest, like, real town is. Birmingham? The, uh, yeah. yeah, Birmingham. And then it's just little flyover country. Actually, the nearest town's probably not in Alabama. It's Chattanooga. Chattanooga. Yikes, dude. Talk about places I don't want to go. <laughs> no, I just offended people from Alabama. I'm sorry, people from Alabama. Or if you're from Fife or Fifey. All right, let's see this last bike. Last bike. 2006 Suzuki GSXR stunt thing. Stunt chainmail. Yeah, look at um, the tank, man. Yeah, the, the stunt chainmail tank is awesome, uh, I got to say. So yeah, a couple things that clearly tells you this is a stunt bike is the cage, the flattened tank, the super ratty nature of it, the fact that it's a, an 06 Jixxer. It's really common to take mid-2000 sport bikes and turn them into stunt bikes like this. Uh, but let's see what they say. It's an 06 clean title, 5K on the motor, has been a lot bike. It's got the R6 Brembo bra handbrake RSC clutch lever motion pro throttles. This is just a crazy run on sentence. I don't even know what I'm reading anymore. <laughs> so many convertible adjustable clip-ons, tank and cage were on the bike when I got it. Stunted X subframe impact sub cage. HT motor. He's just listing off the parts. Yep. So yeah, I think the, uh, the handbrake for the RSC and the clutch lever um, if I remember correctly for wheelie boys and stump boys, they'll put a handbrake on the on the clutch side over here yep. to help control their wheelies mm -hmm. so they don't have to use the rear brake. Um, or they, they, have, they, they have a separate control for the rear brake. Uh, so yeah, I mean, super ratty, super horrible. He would love to trade it for a Grom or a dirt bike, which tells me that this is just a wheelie boy through and through. 100%. He bought this and is like, oh, God, it's an eyesore. I gotta get a Grom. <laughs> He's like, or a dirt bike. I just wanna do wheelies. Um, just go get a DRZ, dude. Why, why even spend the money on the Jixxer? It is interesting, the, the, in the pantheon of stunt boys, you have the 600 stunt boys, and then you have like the Supermoto stunt boys. Mm -hmm. um, would love to hear from, if you, if you were a stunt boy, chime in, what are the pros and cons versus a 600 or like a supermoto? Because I feel like a dirt bike or supermoto is better in every capacity than a 600 to do stunt boy stuff with, mm -hmm. right? I, I can't see the benefit in having a big bike like this to do stunts with, unless you really like the inline four soundtrack, I don't know. Yeah, so I'm feeling like a, like a three out of 10 for this GSXR with this stunt you know, situation here with the chainmail gas tank and all that. Yeah, it's it's not a great bike. It really needs to be put out of its misery. Yeah. But just really just crush it and finish the job with that tank on the top. Yep. You know, Start with your finish and just get rid of it. Just squish put it, it out of its misery. Yeah, yeah. Well, with that, I will bid you adieu, my dudes. I hope you enjoyed the podcast this week. Remember, you can go on to yamiub.co and sign up for our Discord and get access to everything and make sure that you join up on our calls and all of our cool uh, community on there. And if you want to see what we've been alluding to for May 15th for that uh, special thing that's happening on that day, you can sign up on Discord and learn more about it. We'll catch you in the next one. See you later. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. <laughs> <laughs> Bye-bye.